welcome everyone to the conversation. Uh, it's very good to have you uh, for today's virtual, uh, high level virtual event to mark the 25th anniversary of the children in armed conflict mandate at the United Nations. Uh, my name is Bob Ray and I'm Canada's ambassador to the UN in New York. I'm very happy to be your moderator today and looking forward to a vigorous uh, two hour conversation. So we're giving ourselves a good, a good space in which to have this, this chat. Uh, in addition to marking this important anniversary moment, the event today also serves as a launch for a major study initiated by the special representative of the Secretary General, Virginia Gamba, who's with us today, uh, which takes stock of the evolution of the mandate over the past 25 years. Uh, and I'm not going to um, uh, move in on Virginia's territory by try attempting to summarize uh, what the document has to say, except I think it's really important for people to, uh, to look at it. It's a 100 page document, it's substantive. Uh, it has a, a lot to say about our, our history, but also about where we need to go. Uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, I'm delighted that uh, it, the study has been done and that we're, going to, we're getting it out today. This, this, this uh, uh, mandate is really one of the most unique in the, uh, in the history of the United Nations. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 it has come as a result of uh, a tremendous amount of, of, of work and thinking and caring uh, by uh, member states, members of civil society, uh, people involved in peacekeeping and in peace building uh, in the UN. Um, and I think it's important that today we take stock of some of our accomplishments and, and where, where we've been able to make progress as, as well as look at what more needs to be done. Uh, more than 170,000 children have been released from armed forces and groups since this mandate for the CAAC was, was launched. Hundreds of commitments have been taken by parties uh, to the conflict to better protect children, uh, including specific action plans, uh, many of which are currently being implemented. And hundreds more member states have ratified or endorsed key instruments to enhance the protection of children. We're gonna be hearing from a, a number of distinguished speakers and panelists. Well. Everybody on the screen is distinguished. I, I, I can see most of you, and I can, I can say that without hesitation. We will be elaborating on these positive developments and on their impact uh, for conflict affected boys, conflict, conflict affected boys and girls. Other sp speakers and panelists will also share thoughts on how we can overcome the challenges that we're facing in protecting children. And this task is all the more important as we deal with the compounding effects of both COVID-19 and climate change, both of which are having a severe impact on vulnerable children. Um, I, I think we wanna stress something that needs to be, continue to focus our attention on. And that is that the process of establishing rules of war, of establishing the, the roots of humanitarian thinking around if we can't end conflict, how can we ensure that civilians, and in particular, how can we ensure that the most vulnerable are in fact protected when there is conflict? Uh, this is, this is a, an effort that goes back a long way in history, uh, a long way in thinking about the ethics of, of conflict. Uh, and it's an ongoing effort to try to appeal to the sense of what is fair and what is just that lies in the heart of, uh, of women and men everywhere. And it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really important challenge that we're taking on uh, because uh, children are being abused uh, around the world. And just as we can't ignore child abuse in our own countries, we, we can't ignore it when uh, it becomes such an important feature of, of conflict, children being specifically targeted targeted not only for a punishment, but also targeted for recruitment. And I, I know there are many speakers who are gonna focus on this today. Uh, let me, as your friendly moderator, give you some advice. Please turn off your mics until you're speaking, then turn on your mic. How many of us have heard the phrase, 
you're muted. <laughs> so when you want to speak, stop being muted uh, and, and come alive. Uh, we have a very full event, so please keep your interventions as brief as possible. I'll be keeping as strict time as I can. I hate to stop people in mid-sentence, but I would appreciate you recognize that uh, we have over 70 people on the screen, many of whom want to talk. And so in order for everybody to be able to talk, we have to try to keep our, our, our speeches short. There is a pre-established list of speakers. Those who have not pre-registered can request to speak in the chat function, and we're going to endeavor to get to everyone. So enough talk from me. Uh, we're going to hear from the Secretary General. And so roll the video. Here it is. 25 years ago, the global community issued a bold call to action to stop the scourge of children being killed, maimed, recruited, and used in conflict, to stop abductions and sexual violence, to stop attacks on schools and hospitals, and to stop denials of vital humanitarian assistance. The United Nations General Assembly and the Security Council adopted a new mandate to end and prevent these grave violations. And every year since then, the Children and Armed Conflict Office, led by my special representative, works tirelessly to protect children trapped by these conflicts. And the results are inspiring. Over the past 25 years, more than 160,000 children recruited by armed groups and forces have been released. And hundreds of life-saving commitments and action plans have been signed and implemented. Step by step, we are proving that grave violations against children can be stopped, but much more is needed. Children are still in harm's way. Peace is in short supply. Cycles of violence and despair won't stop automatically. All partners need to continue supporting the office's vital monitoring and reporting work. We need to strengthen our support of released children so they can reintegrate into their communities. We need to place the needs and rights of children first in peace negotiations. And we need to honor their bravery and resilience by giving them a full and active voice in their country's future. The children and armed conflict mandate is more important than ever. Let's keep the promise we made 25 years ago. Thank the Secretary General very much for that intervention. Uh, Norway has, has uh, provided substantial leadership to uh, the children and armed conflict agenda at the Security Council, including being chair of the Security Council Working Group. We have the benefit of, of having the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, Minister Anakin Heitfeldt here with us. I saw her this morning in the Security Council, so I can vouch that she was there working hard. It's great to have you with us, Minister. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Bob. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations on the 25th anniversary and thank you for your tireless efforts to protect children growing up in situation of armed conflict. Despite decades of efforts to protect children in armed conflict, much remains to be done. 25 years ago, the Grasa Marcel report stated that in a world of diversity and disparity, children are a unifying force capable to bring people together on common ethical grounds. This report led to the CAC mandate. The Council has repeatedly demonstrated an ability to agree on issues related to children, even in the most demanding situations. As chair of the working group, Norway remains committed to continued unity. But there are many challenges to be dealt with if we are to end and prevent the six grave violations against children and ensure better protection for the millions of children in conflict-affected areas. This anniversary provides an opportunity to recognize the achievement made to better protect children in conflict and to consider the way forward. I would like to highlight three points. First, child protection must be mainstreamed in the Council's work. 
we must provide sufficient personnel and funds to ensure that children are protected by the UN peace operations and political missions. Second, prevention. Member states must take concrete measures to prevent violations against children. Close co coordination between the special representative and international and regional organizations is needed in this regard. Third, the mandate must remain robust, robust. The integrity and independent of the special representative to monitor and report on the six grave violations committed against children is key. All parties in conflict that commit any of the six grave violations against children must be held to the same transparent standards. This includes the listing and delisting criteria. Excellencies, the study launched today is based on input from civil society, member states and UN agencies. Hopefully the study will help increase the impact of the mandate in the years to come. We look forward to reviewing it closely in the time to come. To quote the Secretary General, children simply have no role in conflict. We must use the tools at hand to prevent new cycles of violence and conflict and help build sustainable peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. It's great to have you with us uh, this week and, and uh, to have your leadership on, uh, on this. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Virginia Gamba, who we all know is special representative of the Secretary General. Uh, Virginia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. And thank you also, Madam Minister, for your kind words and for your continued support. Excellencies, ladies and, and gentlemen, last week, eight children were killed in the Nangarhar province of Afghanistan when an explosive remnant of war detonated near a school. In the same week in Myanmar, as the conflict escalates, at least four children were killed and many others injured. In every one of the situations covered in the CAC docket, children are suffering. They are killed and maimed by explosive remnants of war and by active shooting. They're abducted on the way to school. They're raped while fetching wood and water. They're forced to join militias, armed groups and armed forces to feed and sustain conflict. Or they're pushed into volunteering to fight because they have no options due to the socioeconomic difficulties faced by their communities, their lack of education, and their own lack of choice. Even as I speak, I know that hundreds of children will be deprived of humanitarian assistance today. And thousands more will not have a school to go to or a health clinic to tend to their wounds. Today, many more children will be used and abused for, in, and by parties to armed conflict. These are the children that I represent today. These are the ones I bring to witness to this meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, this tragedy for children has been playing in slow motion for dozens of years. We, as the international community, have acknowledged their plight. 25 years ago, the world decided to take an important step, acting together in attempting to protect children from the dreadful impact of hostilities, as the General Assembly through Resolution 5177 created the mandate of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict in 1996. Recognizing the problem and putting in place diverse measures to understand the dynamics of this tragedy has raised awareness and assisted in mitigating and reducing threats to children. Practical engagement has produced results. Over 170,000 children released hundreds of commitments, including 37 active action plans. The ratification of the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the Involvement of Children in Armed Conflict, now ratified by 172 state parties. It has become a demonstration that the international community does not believe that children belong in armed conflict. 
And also member states have coalesced around a series of initiatives to act as preventive tools benefiting children, such as the, the Paris uh, uh, principles, the Vancouver principles, the Safe Schools Declaration. Today, we need to continue to reflect on the needs of children and what still needs to be done to better protect them in these dire circumstances. For this reason, we accompany this event with the publication of the first study ever on the United Nations Children and Armed Conflict Mandate since inception. We look at challenges, gaps, successes, opportunities, but we also recognize obstacles that children continue to face as a result of conflict. I want to thank all the partners who helped us in this study, member states, UN entities and civil society organizations, but, but most importantly, I want to thank those at the heart of the mandate, the children, for their invaluable contribution to this study by allowing their voices to be heard. The study also charts a way forward to further strengthen the protection of children affected by armed conflict and to galvanize international national and local support for the mandate's goals. Ahead of us is an ambitious roadmap based on protection and prevention, collaboration and reintegration. Ladies and gentlemen, the CAC mandate requires us to be proactive, not just reactive. We need to break the cycles of violence that continue to harm children daily. It obligates us to also work towards preventing these violations before they occur. The interconnected nature of our world has become even more visible over the last two years with the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, demonstrating that we need to work together to solve major problems, just like we need to work together if we hope to stop the use and abuse of children in for and by parties to armed conflict. Securing not only the release of children from armed forces and groups, but also securing their sustainable long-term reintegration back into their communities, it has to be everyone's priority. Lastly, it is our responsibility to ensure that reliable and verified information continues to be collected and reported upon. And for this, we need to support and strengthen our child protection experts and monitors and remain vigilant and responsive to changing situations and growing needs. For this reason, I call today on the international community to continue to support our child protection capacity on the ground through supporting our partners from UNICEF, DPO, DPPA, and to support all of us in improving our data collection and analysis so that the engagement can be rapid and focused. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude by addressing those at the heart of the CAC mandate, whom I see here, to Aisha, who will speak in a few minutes, and to the millions of other conflict-affected children who perhaps do not even know of our existence. We stand by you and we believe in you. We might have failed you in the past, but give us a chance to assist you today and in the future. We have come a long way in ensuring that you and all children affected by conflict are better protected from the ravages of war, but we must do more and we must do better. The international community is with you. I promise you, that through collaboration, engagement, and persistence, we will continue to work to fulfill the promise made 25 years ago to better protect children like you. For this reason, today, I recommit my office to act to protect you. We owe you this, and you deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Virginia, so we really appreciate it, and I think you've you've highlighted the the importance of the report and and how much how much work there is still to be done uh, with 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 the the passion that we've come to expect from your leadership. Um, we're now going to turn to the what's called the panel interventions, um, and we we have a number of uh, very distinguished panelists who are with us. Uh, let me get right to it. Um, our first panelist to speak will be. Uh, someone that I would describe as a life force within the UN system. Uh, for those of us who've worked with her, 
And it's been a great pleasure for Canada to work so closely with UNICEF. Uh, Henrietta Four is uh, the executive director. I'm gonna turn the floor to you now, Henrietta. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ray. Uh, deeply appreciated. And uh, thank you today for your support and to special representative Gamba, uh, to you and to your staff and to the permanent mission of Norway and to Minister Whitfeld for the strength of your support worldwide. Uh, thank you also to our sister UN agencies, the permanent missions of Niger, Argentina, Mexico, Canada, and to Mr. Dallaire, Mr. Whitaker, and of course, Aisha for joining us to mark this occasion. The 25th anniversary study being launched today is a product of a significant effort across the UN. As Virginia has just outlined, it provides a detailed description of the evolution of UN's mechanism for monitoring and reporting grave violations through the children and armed conflict agenda. It also outlines a vision for how to strengthen the mandate further. As we mark the 25th anniversary of the mandate of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict, I want to emphasize the positive impact that the mandate has had on the lives of children. UNICEF is proud of its role in the Children and Armed Conflict agenda. Our staff in collaboration with other UN and partner organizations judiciously collect and verify information on grave violations so that we can better understand and respond to the needs of children and surviving families. We also engage those responsible for violations with a concrete goal of preventing further violations. These efforts have achieved concrete results for children. For example, since 2000, at least 170,000 children have been released from armed forces and armed groups. Many have survived multiple violations, including abduction and sexual violence. Each of these cases represents an individual child who has suffered terrible violence. Each is also a courageous survivor or witness but there are many children who still need our help. And that is why we must continue to collect these stories even amidst dangerous circumstances. And that is why we must continue to speak up and speak out, especially when children, families, or witnesses are unable to do so. Looking ahead, the United Nations should continue to prioritize this precious and unique mandate. We should seize all opportunities to increase visibility and awareness of the terrible impact of conflict on children. We should be courageous in taking steps to end impunity and advance accountability for children in situations of armed conflict. It is critical that the United Nations at all levels remains empowered to engage with all parties to conflict, including groups designated as terrorist. Action to reduce the suffering of children in armed conflict starts with dialogue and the mandate to protect children's lives should not be politicized. We must also protect children from the reverberating consequences of conflict and from the stick stigma of re-victimization that may come with surviving grave violations. This includes protecting child victims of recruitment from detention and ensuring that they are not denied citizenship. It is imperative that parties to conflict commit to full compliance with the international humanitarian law. Governments should demonstrate leadership by developing zero tolerance policies on grave violations against children in situations of armed conflict. And finally, we call on the entire international community to take ambitious, principled, and concrete actions to fulfill the rights of all children living in situations of armed conflict. This commitment will help to ensure that every child can reach her or his full potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Thank you, Henrietta. Thank you so much for this. Uh, we're going to hear from two, not one, but two undersecretaries who have a deep interest in this subject, Rosemary DiCarlo um, and, uh, and Jean-Pierre Lacroix. Uh, first of all, to you, Rosemary, and then to Jean-Pierre, who's going to join us on video. Rosemary, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, I'm very pleased to join you to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Children in Armed Conflict Mandate. 
I'd like to thank Minister Wheatfeld and Norway for their steadfast support for this agenda. And I also want to pay tribute to Special Representative Virginia Gumba and her predecessors for the remarkable work they have done over the last 25 years. As conflicts have become more intractable and protracted, civilians, particularly women and children, are paying the heaviest toll. Our joint efforts to protect children in armed conflicts from the grave violations first identified in, by the Security Council in 1999 could not be more urgent today. Child recruitment, killing and maiming, rape and other forms of sexual violence, abduction, attacks on schools and hospitals, denials of humanitarian assistance tragically remain all too common realities for children in many parts of the world where we operate. The special political missions my department oversees carry out a wide range of activities to protect children in conflict situations, from early warning, monitoring and analysis, to political and programmatic engagement. In several missions, child protection advisors report regularly on violence against children and other child protection gaps, helping guide political engagement. In Iraq, for example, UNAMI has been able to work closely with national authorities to help verify and mitigate grave violations against children, such as recruitment by ISIL and other non-state armed groups. The mission has also assisted the government in reintegration of hundreds of children that had been recruited by armed actors and in developing long-term programs to protect the rights to education for children from all social, ethnic, linguistic, and religious groups. Our convening power and expertise can give us real leverage to advocate for child protection with national actors. In Colombia, for example, from the early stages of the UN involvement in the peace process, my department and the Office of the Special Representative work closely with the parties to put emphasis on the issue of child protection. The UN's advocacy was instrumental in convincing the parties to commit to the early release of children from the FARC EP and to the establishment of a special program to reintegrate them into their families. Excellencies, to more fully address the risks that children face in conflict environments, we need to work closely with other actors and craft collective responses. In Somalia, UNSAM has partnered with the federal government, local communities, and civil society in the implementation of the government's action plan on children in armed conflict. This involves conducting joint screenings in military camps to verify the presence of children and providing training to the Somali National Army, police, and judges, as well as the African Union mission in Somalia. Excellencies, today's event is an opportunity to recommit ourselves to ensuring that children are protected from the destruction caused by war. My hope is that in commemorating future anniversaries of this agenda, we will be able to recognize progress made in ending violations against children in armed conflict settings. This is vital for children and for building peace in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for that, uh, for those words and that presentation and your leadership. Uh, Jean-Pierre Lacroix is going to join us on video. Je vous vois. Dear colleagues, first, let me congratulate the special representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict as we mark today an important milestone. 25 years ago, the Children and Armed Conflict mandate was established, positively impacting the lives of children affected by conflict. Five years later, our peace operations were entrusted with the mandate to protect those who are most vulnerable, children. This historic decision by the Security Council came as the nature of conflict was changing and children were increasingly bearing the brunt of armed conflict. Since the inclusion by the Security Council of child protection in the mandate of peacekeeping operation, tireless efforts of our civilian and uniformed personnel have transformed the lives of countless boys and girls. Peacekeepers have engaged in dialogue with parties to conflict to hold and prevent grave violations against children. For example, in August last year in Mali, action plans were signed with a coalition of our movements to end and prevent the recruitment and use of children. 
thanks to joint advocacy by our peace operation in Mali, MINUSMA, and the special representative of the Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflicts. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, up to 2,500 children, including over 350 girls, were voluntarily released by armed groups in just the past three and a half years as a result of dedicated joint efforts. Peacekeepers have played a crucial role in helping monitor and report on grave violations against children, and they continue to ensure that child protection aspects are included in peace negotiations and agreements. The protection of children is at the heart of UN peacekeeping. With support from member states, we are working to reinforce the capacity of our personnel to proactively halt and prevent grave violations against children. We are doing this, including by strengthening training on child protection for all peacekeeping personnel and enhancing the way we evaluate child protection performance across our operations. Despite the extreme challenges they face every day, our peacekeepers remain determined to play their part in protecting boys and girls affected by armed conflict. As we look to the future, we should never forget that maintaining peace, security and stability is the best way to protect children and that in turn, protection of children is essential to building lasting peace and stability for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate the, the leadership uh, of, of the Secretariat so much and, and uh, it, it really is helping to bring a lot of diverse voices together. We're going to hear some more from those voices. Uh, first of all, from Forrest Whitaker, who's the a, a major advocate for, for children affected by war. He's the founder and CEO of the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative. And uh, we're going to hear directly from him now on video. Dear Virginia, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to address this meeting to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Office of the Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. While the fate of the children and youth engulfed in conflict remains one of the most painful thorns in our consciousness as global citizens, it's satisfying to observe that in the past 25 years, there's been real progress. Because an immense majority of the world's countries have committed to end the use of child soldiers and to protect the rights of children trapped in conflicts. For this, we must thank the continued efforts of the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict. I want to exclude my friend, Virginia Gamba, with whom I have been collaborating since she assumed office. Her dedication and determination have made a, a difference for the renewal of the mandate and the strengthening of the International Coalition on Reintegration in support of the cause of children and armed conflict. I'd also like to commend the work of her predecessor, Ms. Lila Zurige, with whom I started working when I first established my organization, the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative. I was with her on one of my first important film missions at the helm of WPDI. This was in South Sudan, a few months after the beginning of the Civil War. We had traveled for hours on a dirt road to meet with a rebel leader and convince him to release the children enrolled in his ranks. This was not an easy negotiation, but it worked. We successfully obtained the release of dozens of youths. This victory was made even greater as we took our results back to Juba, the capital, and convinced the South Sudanese president to order an additional release of scores of child soldiers and even sign a commitment to cease enrolling children in the National Army. This experience was not just moving, it was a defining moment. I had previously met with former child soldiers and learned of the immense obstacles some face, both because they are lost years of education and because their communities often reject them. Participating directly in the demobilization of child soldiers made me realize that their emancipation was only the beginning. There had to be a continuity of action on our part to help them reintegrate society as normal citizens. This is defined some of my key areas of focus today as I strive to empower children, youth, and women living in conflict areas, especially aiming to support former child soldiers and peacemakers and social entrepreneurs. Former child soldiers who've been reintegrated, rehabilitated, are among the most dedicated and motivated advocates of peace and reconciliation. With mindful assistance, they can become highly valuable assets for their community. In this sense, your meeting today is critical. You have the power to increase the world's awareness about the situations faced by children affected by conflict. You have the power to channel resources that will help to transform their lives and make this world a more peaceful place. 
And I know you use that power. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. We're going to turn now to uh, my fellow Canadian and great friend, uh, colleague, uh, and a, a, a visionary uh, in this field, uh, who's done more than almost any one single person to uh, heighten attention globally on the importance of, of dealing with the tragedy of, uh, of child soldiers. And that's my friend, Romeo Dallaire. General, you're, you're up. Thank you very, very much, uh, Senator Ray, and uh, sorry, Ambassador Ray. And uh, I'm most appreciative uh, of the opportunity of addressing uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and particularly Virginia Gamba and her team. First, uh, bravo to Virginia on the report and on the efforts to actually bring this 25th anniversary to the fore of our attention as a reference point as we continue to move the art sticks to preventing the use of children as instruments of war. Uh, secondly, thank you for permitting the Delaire Institute for Peace and Children and Peace and Security and Dr. Shelley Whitman to be part of your team in putting together this report. And she uh, has been uh, the leading subject matter expert in our institute and as the executive director to move uh, us and uh, others into the realm of prevention of the recruitment of children. Uh, third, I'm only a soldier, and a soldier who, however, uh, saw how the use of children, uh, the use of children as child soldiers, as instruments of exterminating of massive horrors against human beings, uh, the extent to which they could influence uh, a situation and render it even worse, uh, leading up to and including genocide. So there is no doubt in my military mind of the significance of trying to prevent the use of children uh, as instruments in these conflicts. I'd like to particularly thank also uh, that uh, uh, Ambassador Ray is uh, in fact uh, chairing this uh, scenario today because uh, the Canada and the Institute uh, have uh, over the last few years put together and published in 2017, uh, the Vancouver Principles on the prevention and the use of children uh, as child soldiers. And that launching that was done uh, with the Canadian government and our work uh, with uh, the staffing and the uh, efforts of the team uh, in New York in particular, have uh, permitted uh, us to see 107 countries join in to wanting to implement, looking at the implementation uh, of the guidelines to see these Vancouver principles being used deliberately as instruments for nations who have been providing troops as contributing nations to give them a more effective operational capability in order to be able to reduce the casualties of children and of course of peacekeepers themselves in attempting this. And so today, Ambassador Ray, by you being there is signaling certainly the commitment of and the prioritization of Canada to the Vancouver principles and also to its implementation as part of the peace process and the protection of children. But working hand in hand with the Canadian government is an important step. However, we're looking at all the true contributing nations to want to move and particularly with uh, in support of uh, Madame Gamba's team uh, to advance the ability to enhance our capacity to implement the principles and in fact, uh, to increase the reporting capabilities of those who are deployed uh, to bring the attention of this terrible flail uh, to the minds of those who are trying to achieve peace. It is in the mind uh, that we are very pleased to see Norway's prioritization of CAC and that mandate and hope that we will further see this partnership extended. Uh, and with that in mind, I should only like to bring the following point to you as a concluding comment. In this, uh, our complex world that we are in, looking for lasting peace, preventing children from being recruited into violence needs to be a priority and applied in practice. 
Looking at the next 25 years, as was requested, leaders of government, as well as the UN level of involvement, must move forward to put the resources available in order to meet this critical component of peace processes. The elimination of the use of children as part of the instruments of sustaining these conflicts has got to be taken away from the equation. We need to place the children at the center of our efforts to create peace and security. And the UN and member states who have helped us to collectively push the agenda of peace as the future of humanity depends on it can reinforce Madame Gamba's team and reinforce the lasting peace process by taking the children out of the equation of conflict and in fact, making them a source of gathering of those who are trying to seek peace to move that peace agenda through the children's elimination as a source of mobilization and sustaining of conflict. And so specifically, I look for innovative thinking and peacemaking and continued support and work with UNICEF as we do often in the field, but particularly with Madame Gamba's team as we work towards ultimately taking the children out of the equation and considering child rights up front as the priority of establishing lasting peace and getting out of these generational conflicts that are being sustained by the use of children. And so thank you ever so much for what you've done, uh, Virginia and your team. And thank you for all those who are already committing so many troops to trying to establish lasting peace. Let's give them more tools. Let's implement as an example, those Vancouver principles. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Romeo. It's wonderful to hear from you. And, and uh, to, again, your continuing commitment is, uh, is an example to, uh, to all of us. Uh, our next speaker is Aisha Zana, uh, who is uh, an advocate for girls' education. She comes from Maiduguri, Nigeria. Um, and she made a very important contribution to the 25th anniversary report by convening roundtables with children um, in her community, uh, which helped to bring their perspectives into the study. So Aisha, the floor is yours. It's very good to have you with us. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, fellow young people, I would like to begin by thanking you for this honor. My name is Aisha Zana Mustafa from Future Prowess Islamic Foundation, a foundation in the northeastern part of Nigeria, Bono State, the birthplace of the Boko Haram insurgency, the militant group in northern Nigeria that has killed tens and thousands of people and displaced nearly three million. Future Prowess provides education and hope to the less privileged, displaced, marginalized kids and youths in Borno. I am pleased to join you today on the 25th anniversary of the Children and Armed Conflict Mandate and to brief you on the protection of children in situations of armed conflict. When you think of conflict, do children ever cross your mind? Yet thousands of children are coerced to fight wars. Thousands are born into conflict. Thousands are made to do the unthinkable. The nature of conflict has changed in so many ways. I want you to imagine a classroom. The teacher asks a question on what do you want to be in the future? Normally, children would say a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a politician, a pilot. But none of these answer, their faces blink. And a week after, the class is empty because of displacement, violent responsibilities on their young heads. For a lot of these kids, tomorrow is, their, is not their problem. Their problem starts today. Facing betrayal from family and society is an instance I remember in the case of Fatima and her two brothers, who were kidnapped by their maternal grandfather and taken to Sambiza for five years, while their mother searched for them tirelessly till she gave up. While in the forest, Fatima was used as a human shield and her brothers trained as child soldiers. They were lucky an older boy who decided to escape took them along and brought them back to the city. But these children are still haunted by what happened in the forest. They are still accepting their unpleasant past and learning to trust the society in the future for our school. 
for a lot of these children and these girls, how do they cope in a society that has failed them at such a young age? There are countless such stories, some of them like this one and many more. The past years have shown us a series of grave violations against children in both decades long and new conflicts from Nigeria to Ethiopia to Yemen to Sudan. Thousands of children are youth and youths are paying the prices for tribal, intercommunal violence and insurgency. Every week, a child is lost in Borno State, Nigeria, to violence, hunger, and so many other violations away from the headlines. My own story might be different from the others, but we all have had to face the fears of living in a society that has peer resistance to girl child education and women empowerment. As a young lady who has been lucky enough to have the opportunity to get a good education and a voice, I am here to tell you that women and children are bearing the brunt of the violence. They continue to be at risk of targeted attacks. It breaks my heart every time I see it and I experience it, and it makes me feel guilty for being the lucky one. It makes me question what made me so special. And I wake up every day trying to fight for them. The insurgency has been going on for years, and I innately fear that we wouldn't be able to help the girls in my community. Every day, a sister comes back with a child, widowed, a mother and a teenager, struggling to take care of her child in a society that fuels her with distrust and stigma, looking for acceptance for her child in a society that blames the innocent for the faults of its father. Today, I am here for the nameless and the named ones and calling everyone to commit to formal action plans and take concrete measures to protect children, especially girls. World leaders must fulfill the gap, wide gap in aid funding so that women and children can receive protection and meet their essential needs. These include, include preventing grave violations from occurring in the first place, with the use of early warning systems, releasing children from armed forces and groups, protecting children from sexual violence and stopping attacks on hospitals and schools, especially schools. In a spiral of boom, in a spiral of doom that Boko Haram has caused and other insurgencies around the world are causing, attacks on schools deny children education and it causes lasting damage to the children and youths and also to their communities and societies. They end up feeling dissociated, disassociated from their communities and feed the grievances and frustrations that lead to extremism, creating a vicious cycle of tension and violence. Education is all we have to change our futures. It starts and ends there. Without this, our futures are gone. I thank this council for its systematic engagement on this issue in several re resolutions over the past 25 years. In a continent worst affected by conflict, Rwanda is a great example that the protection of children can bring parties to conflict together and build confidence and peace. However, despite these efforts, the figures for grave violations against children in conflict continue to rise. We must all do more. We need to recognize that children needs and rights must be considered during all phases of conflict, from prevention efforts to mediation and recovery to sustainable inclusive development and it should welcome the involvement and participation of children with appropriate support. By integrating children into peace processes, we can achieve concrete results for children and for peace that can last for decades. I thank everyone who is involved in the protection of children and developing systematic solutions for children around the world. And I strongly encourage actors and youths around the world to be involved in the peace processes and to take concrete actions that prioritize the protection of children affected by conflict at the national, regional, and global levels. Thank you for your time. Aisha, thank you so much. Your words are very, very profound and have such an impact on all of us. I, I really want to thank you for what you do. And you, you may ask yourself why you're so special. I think you've demonstrated to all of us why you're so special. Uh, you're a great leader and uh, we really appreciate your inspiration today. It's, it's been it's been fantastic having you with us. I hope you can stay for the rest of the of the discussion. It's just been great. Um, colleagues, it, 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 uh, it falls to me now to introduce uh, some of my colleagues from the United Nations who are here. 
Um, they have a hard act to follow in following Aisha. I'm like, going to call on my friend, Ambassador de Riviere from France, um, and then, then to uh, Juan Ramon from Mexico. France and Mexico, among other countries, have been very involved in this initiative, and we really appreciate your leadership. Uh, Nicolas. Merci beaucoup, uh, Bob. Uh, je salue uh, l'engagement. I commend the commitment of Canada, but I also commend Norway's commitment on this major issue of defending children in armed conflicts. I'd like to thank the different speakers for their briefings. In the context of the 25th anniversary of its mandate, I'd in particular like to commend Virginia Gambas, the SRSG, and her team. I pay tribute to all of your predecessors who've carried out remarkable work since 1996. 25 years after the establishment of the mandate, the children armed conflict agenda illustrates best what the multilateral system can do best when it's vigilant, united, and when it has an effective tool at its disposal. We're aware of, you're, you know, the role that the Fran that France has played in establishing a working group uh, on this. It is a role that very much honors us. Violations against children, unfortunately, are continuing. We need to remain mobilized. We need to use these tools as best as we can. This involves several different types of action. Firstly, we must combat impunity. The perpetrators of violations must be brought to justice, in particular those who commit repeated abuse. We commend here the work of the ICC and national jurisdictions. We would like to highlight sanctions as well that are perhaps not sufficiently used in the Security Council on this. Secondly, it's important to give increased support to the monitoring and communication mechanisms that we have. These should have necessary human and material resources to continue to document grave violations. This is absolutely crucial. They should enable the UN Secretary General to establish a list annexed to his annual report rigorously and objectively. The third area is the work of the working group. This is decisive. We regret the fact that there have been some obstacles and blockages that have hampered us from responding to situations. We need to think how to best ensure uh, monitoring of conclusions of the working group on the ground and follow up of it, because that's not uh, that's what in, is important, not the reports. We continue to support those projects that help to provide access to all children, including girls and most vulnerable children, to education, in particular in crisis and conflict situations. This is why France supports UNICEF in particular, the Education Cannot Wait Fund and the Global Partnership for Education. And we pay tribute to all civil society actors involved in this area. Of course, we need to better take into consideration the disproportionate effect uh, conflicts have on women and here on girls. And we underscore the priority that Ms. Gamba has given to prevention. In conclusion, because we are commemorating the 15th anniversary of the Paris commitment this year. I welcome the recent assigning of Jordan and Mongolia of this, and I call for its universal uh, signing and the Vancouver um, principles as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola says the moderator, I thank you for your ongoing leadership. It is so important. I now give the floor to my colleague and friend, Juan Ramon from Mexico. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Bob. And thank you for chairing the group of friends of children in armed conflict with commitment and leadership, which is always inspiring to us. Mexico is very pleased to co-sponsor this meeting to commemorate the 25th anniversary 
of the establishment of the mandate on children in armed conflict. The topic is of the highest priority for my country. We are proud to have chaired the working group from 2009 to 2010 and to have put forth resolution 1882, which strengthened the group's mandate. It is also a source of great satisfaction to serve this year as co-chairs of the group. Mexico sees that there have been significant progress and positive results in the last 25 years. And in that regard, we would like to acknowledge the untiring efforts of Madame Gamba and her predecessors. Safeguarding the rights and needs of childhood should be a central focus of all efforts geared to preventing conflict. And it is for that reason that it is important to make the protection of children a cross-cutting issue in the Council's agenda. And this is absolutely necessary. Also is necessary is the strengthening of the presence of advisors for protecting children in all peacekeeping operations and mandates. Notwithstanding the progress achieved, there are still many challenges that remain. The pandemic has exacerbated the vulnerability of girls and boys, and among some of the most harmful consequences, we must include violence, ill treatment in its various forms, and especially sexual violence. The impact of sexual violence on biological and emotional health of boys and girls is particularly serious. All survivors, without exception, should have access to comprehensive health care services that are adapted to their needs individually, including, of course, sexual and reproductive health care, as well as mental health and other measures for so psychosocial support. We must also be resounding in our conviction. Hospitals and schools must be safe spaces at all times. While we do have a specific mandate and a structure that makes it possible for us to monitor the situation on the ground, the big challenge lies in instrumentation of the group's conclusions and the resolutions of the Council itself. How can we make sure that these are implemented with greater effectiveness? With a view to making some progress along these lines, I'd like to highlight three specific areas. First, what's necessary is more rigorous follow-up to the group's conclusions. Second, the Security Council should take more energetic measures with those parties that are in conflict that in a repetitive manner or recurring manner tend to commit violations against the rights of children and are constantly listed in the annexes of the Secretary General's report. And three, we must make sure that there's greater coordination between the working group and other subsidiary bodies of the Council, particularly the sanctions committees. Mexico would like to reaffirm its commitment to this agenda, which is one of the most sensitive of all of them because it is one of the most unfair children suffering due to armed conflict. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Ramon says, Rob, Bob. The next speaker on my list is my friend from Niger. Ambassador, are you there, sir? I have Abdu on the list, but I can't see him on the screen. Are you there, Abdu? I am here, sir. You can see me, I'm sure, sir. Yes, it's much better. It's not so good if we just look at your photo. It's better to see you in person. Thank you, thank you, dear friend. If there is one cause that warrants being defended, it is indeed that of children, and in particular, those of protecting them in situations of armed conflict. How much time, for how much time, sir, 
do we need to see children in Syria, Afghanistan, Colombia, Libya, in Yemen, in Burma, or in the Sahel, for just mentioning these, suffer? Niger is proud to co-sponsor this anniversary event. This event addresses one of the priorities of our term as non-permanent member of the Security Council that has just concluded. Niger remains committed to support you in your work to protect children, in particular those living in armed conflict situations, as we're well aware are the most vulnerable. The mandate of the Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations on children armed conflict was set up a quarter of a century ago, 30 years after the entry into force of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it is extremely important because this gives us the opportunity to evaluate the progress accomplished and to look at the future. At this stage, I would like to welcome to this meeting Madam Anniken Huitfeld, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, to this meeting. This highlights the significant commitment of her country to the cause of children. I'd also like to thank our speakers, and in particular, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Ms. Uh, Gamba, Mrs. Henrietta Four, and Mr. Forrest Whitaker, whose commitments to this issue are well known to us all. I would also like to express my gratitude to Madam Aisha Zana. Her poignant words move us to step up efforts to take into consideration the rights of children and young people in the design and implementation of UN mandates, mission mandates rather, in countries and regions in conflict or post-conflict situations. So, it is true that suffering caused by armed conflict are experienced by all social strata. However, it's nonetheless the case that children are those who pay the greatest, greatest price. This is because they're vulnerable and this impacts their development and therefore their future. As we say, children are the future of the world. It's therefore crucial that we work to invest in protecting these children of the future so that they inherit a world of peace and prosperity. In order to do so, there's a need to tackle properly conflicts and other security and humanitarian crises. They have increased and have become more complex over the past two years in particular because of the combined effect of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. This context undermines not only peace and stability, but also undermines systems to protect people, and in particular, women and children. The recent report of the Secretary General highlights indeed an increase in the number of children's rights violations over recent years, with more than 26,400 serious violations committed against children and uh, confirmed rather in 21 countries. We can nonetheless welcome the fact that thanks to intensive awareness raising campaigns and dialogue with parties to the conflict carried out by the office of SRSG Gamba, more than 12,600 children were released or reintegrated into society in 2020. Mr. Moderator, as we constantly reiterated during our term in the Security Council, access to education for all, including for children affected by armed conflict, is crucial. Education is a pillar of preventing violent extremism and conflict. It's also a question of justice. It is our firm belief that educated children are the spearhead of a responsible society. They are the pillars upon which a strong nation must be built. This is why the new authorities in Niger have made education a priority of our governance program, since education should serve as a lever for resolving and tackling the root causes of poverty and violent extremism in the long term. It is to be regretted that in the Sahel region, many schools that ha have been closed due to the security crises and attacks against uh, schools carried out by armed terrorist groups. And this number has increased sixfold since 2017. About 5,000 closed school, uh, schools have been closed, rather, upsetting the education of more than 700,000 children, depriving more than 20,000 teachers of the possibility of carrying out their jobs. Given the scale of the violations of children's rights, 
in particular their fundamental right to education. It is high time to have a normative framework to combat this. Niger is delighted to have made its modest contribution. We've put forward initiatives that have led to the adoption by the UN Security Council of a presidential statement on the protection of schools against attacks. This was in September 2020, and the very first resolution on the protection of education in conflicts at the end of October 2021. And we cooperated with Belgium and Norway, respectively, on this. Children are the victim of armed conflicts. They are forced against their wishes to be stakeholders in violence, which leaves um, enormous and long-lasting psychological scars. This is why setting up support uh, for rehabilitation and reintegration programs, including supporting education and training for children and young people who've escaped from armed conflicts is absolutely critical. With this in mind, Niger has set up a rehabilitation and re-education uh, center for children who've escaped from Boko Haram and also for those who are in a situation of distress. All these children want is the opportunity to have a normal life so that they can be useful to society. We should welcome the progress made over the past 25 years since the children armed conflict mandate was set up. However, we have to recognize that much remains to be done to bring an end to violations of the rights of children, in particular those who are in armed conflicts. To this end, I'd like to make the following recommendations. They are likely to help to contribute to building on achievements to date. Firstly, there's a need to step up awareness raising among parties to the conflict and among parents on their responsibility to protect the rights of children in areas of conflict. Secondly, there's a need to improve and foster means of documenting children's rights violations in order to take this into account better in preparing responses to particular situations. Thirdly, there's a need to comprehensively tackle the issue of insecurity by tackling the root causes of conflict. These are poverty, social inequality and illiteracy. Finally, there's a need to provide significant support to fragile countries and to those that are in conflict or in post-conflict situations through projects to contribute to building peace and to building the resiliency of those affected populations. In conclusion, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to reiterate my country's commitment and its willingness to work with all affected parties to bring an end to children's rights violations, in particular those affected by armed conflict. In sum, protecting children is protecting the future of our countries and of the world in its entirety. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Abdu. Listen, you're carrying out extraordinary work, not just for your country, but also on the causes that we're tackling together. And I really congratulate you from all of us for the work that you carried out in the Security Council as regards children, uh, education, the conflicts in the Sahel, etc., etc. We really congratulate you on this extraordinary work that you've carried out. It's wonderful to see you and patiently waiting. She'll be the last of the panelists who will be speaking. Up to you, Maria. Paciencia, paciencia, Bob. Patience, Bob. Patience. You know the last will be first later. Excellencies, colleagues, friends. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Secretary General and the Special Representative of the Secretary General for the issue of children in armed conflict, Madam Virginia Gamba, for organizing this commemorative event for the 25th anniversary of the mandate, whereby Argentina is very pleased in sponsoring it with other delegations. I'd also like to thank Ambassador Ryan for co-sponsoring this meeting and for chairing the group of friends. This occasion is a great opportunity to reflect on the achievements and analyzing pending challenges. It is also a time we can express our support and recognition to the special representative of the Secretary General for her highlighted efforts 
and the presentation of the study on the evolution of the mandate since its creation in 1996. For Argentina, it is a great honor to have been part of the process in crafting this report, and we would like to highlight the importance of its broad dissemination. Clearly, since the creation of the mandate, millions of boys and girls have benefited from greater protection. More than 170,000 children have been released from forces or armed groups, and 172 states parties have ratified the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the participation of children in armed conflict. Moreover, other initiatives, such as the Principles of Paris, the Principles of Vancouver, and the Declaration on Safe Schools, are preventative tools available to us to benefit boys and girls. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the extreme vulnerability and lack of protection that boys and girls need to grapple with when they are victims of armed conflict. It is absolutely key to adopt a protection-based approach, which is also based on human rights and includes a gender perspective. Argentina's commitment to the full protection and promotion of the human rights of boys and girls who are victims of armed conflict dates back many years. My country was one of the first states to ratify in the year 2002 the optional protocol of the Convention on the Rights of Children on the participation of children in armed conflict. Argentina firmly supports the organization's efforts to prevent, avoid, and detain the six serious violations of the rights of children in the context of armed conflict. We have accompanied the adoption of many resolutions of the Security Council on this topic. Argentina has also endorsed the Paris Principles and Commitments in 2007 and the Vancouver Principles of 2017. We have also led, along with Norway, in the Declaration of Safe Schools and its guidelines to prevent the use, military use of schools and universities during armed conflict which was adopted in the Oslo Com Conference in 2015 and endorsed by 113 states. Subsequently, Argentina was the headquarters for the second international conference on safe schools in March of 2017. More recently, we co-organized with Norway, Nigeria, and Spain the fourth international conference, which was held in Nigeria in October, October of 2021. Education, is one of the fundamental human rights and a pillar of development with equity for all peoples. And therefore, all possible efforts must be made in order to protect it. Finally, Argentina would like to highlight the very important work of the Global Coalition for the Reintegration of Child Soldiers and its comprehensive approach to achieving children's reintegration in a repaired manner, which is geared towards the future with a gender perspective included and focused on the specific needs of boys and girls. 25 years after its creation, Argentina renews its strong commitment to the efforts of the mandate. We are of the firm conviction that only working to achieve a humanitarian approach which is based on development and peace, will we be able to achieve sustainable results that guarantee the respect of human rights and the successful reintegration of all boys and girls into societies which are fairer, more peaceful, and more egalitarian. Thank you very much. Much appreciated, and it was worth the wait. It was worth it. It was good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, colleagues, we now turn to the open session which is uh, perhaps a little bit misnamed because speakers are pre-registered. We have a list, a speaker's list of, of about 22, um, and we have about 45 minutes left. So you do the math. Uh, I'm only the gatekeeper here. Um, you've got to keep it short uh, because we have to stop at five out of respect for our colleagues who have been doing the interpretation. They have a hard stop at five. So we have a hard stop at five. So I'm gonna shut up and turn my attention to Philippe, who's next. I have, just so you know, I have um, uh, Philippe followed by Qatar and I'll, then I'll go, I'll do the speakers five at, five at a time. So 
you'll be warned, but try and keep it short if you can. L'ambassadeur, vous êtes là? Filippo. Oui. oui, Bob, je ne sais pas okay. si tu me vois. Don't know if you see me. Uh, on ne te voit pas, mais c'est dommage. Mais uh, <laughs> le voix, c'est le plus important. Uh, so, So I, I, okay, yeah, very well, Bob, and I will follow your advice. I'll do my intervention first in English and then I'll switch to French and I'll, I'll, do, a, I'll do a switch as, as fast as I can. I would like to um, um, th thank you and, and th thanks to Madame Gamba for USG Gamba for presenting the study on the CAC mandate uh, uh, today, a study to which Belgium proudly contributed. Thank you also to the previous speakers and particularly to Madame Aisha for highlighting the importance of girls' education especially in the Sahel, which is a region facing enormous challenges, as Ambassador Abari has just reminded us. And I would like to add also that Belgium aligns itself with the statements of the European Union. Uh, since the creation of the mandate, my dear colleagues, millions of children have directly or indirectly benefited from enhanced protection. However, another 250 million currently live in conflict-affected areas and are at great risk of acts of violence committed by perpetrators who are not properly held accountable. Accountability is key to ensure children's protection from armed forces and groups. And I would like to underline three points in this regard. First, the need for continued support to the monitoring and reporting mechanism, MRM. Two, the critical importance of integrating child protection into judicial tools and enhanced cooperation with the International Criminal Court. And three, the government's adherence to international norms. First colleagues, it is important to emphasize that without data from the field, accountability is impossible. The CAC monitoring and reporting mechanism, MRM, is the principal accountability mechanism that records violations against children. And we do thank the MRM staff for their commitment and professionalism. Resources in that field are scarce. And uh, this is why Belgium recently allocated 2 million euro to UNICEF for monitoring and reporting cases of children in armed conflict. And we encourage others to follow suit. I will now switch to French. Deuxièmement, il est essentiel de reconnaître que les enfants sont des victimes particulièrement vulnérables des conflits armés. important to recognize that children are particularly vulnerable victims for armed conflict today. Unfortunately, children are not in the place that is due them in our legal proceedings. And we thus appeal to children being systematically recognized as a category of victims, which is apart from trans transitional justice mechanisms in different national and international courts. Moreover, we think that strength and cooperation with international mechanisms such as the International Criminal Court would help. To that end, Belgium organized at the end of 2020 an informal session with the Special Representative on armed, Children in Armed Conflict and the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who also participated in the side event last year, looked at a focus on children in the International Criminal Court. Finally, for the strengthening of the fight against impunity to be on the agenda of all of us, and for international instruments that already exist to be entirely implemented properly. We would call upon all parties to conflicts to fully respect their obligation based on human rights, international humanitarian law, and the rights of refugees and the law that governs them. We also encourage member states to ratify the optional protocol to the Convention on Children's Rights, the Vancouver and Paris principles, and to approve and implement the Declaration on the Safety in Schools. And all of her predecessors for all the achievements of the 25 first years of the mandate CAC really does represent the UN at its best and I mean it Belgium will continue to mobilize in support of the mandate starting today with the dissemination of the study and I conclude by thanking the, the co-organizers and I do wish Norway the very best for the continuation of their presidency of the Security Council's CAC working group thank you for your attention Thank you, Philippe, uh, very much. Um, the next uh, five speakers are um, as follows. Well, let me just start, go to Qatar right away, and then I'll do the rest. Qatar.
Qatar there? Hasim, are you there? And we're not we're not getting you. We I can see you, uh, but I can't see you. I saw your note. So Hasim is there. Hasim, I'll come right back to you. Albania, are you there? I think it's taking a while to get people on as panelists. Um, I can only now see Philippe. So uh, let me just try to keep moving here. Um, is UK there? Hmm. I think what technicians are gonna have to bring people on. Um, I can see my colleague from Slovenia is there, so I'm gonna let him speak. <laughs> Can you get on? Vasjana, can you get on? Yes, hi. Hi. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, Excellencies, uh, allow me to, to thank the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict first. I also thank Norway for organizing this event, plus gratitude for to all the, all the panelists. Uh, we wish to express our deepest gratitude to the SRSG and uh, all the UN personnel on the ground for their invaluable work. In, in preventing, documenting, um, monitoring violations of, of children's rights in conflict. Ensuring accountability is key to preventing the reoccurrence of such violations and for victims and survivors to receive justice. Uh, challenges to protection of, of, of children continue to appear. Uh, children must be protected from harm and must be able to live in peaceful and safe environment. Um, Slovenia ratified optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the involvement of children in armed conflicts. And our national resolution on development cooperation humanitarian assistance defines the assistance in armed conflict, in particular for children, uh, as, as the priority of Slovenian humanitarian aid. Nationally, we have been supporting several programs to assist children affected by conflicts. In recent years, over 500 children from conflict and post-conflict areas have received psychological and, and physical assistance in, and rehabilitation in Slovenia. Through our national, our rights projects and teaching materials, Slovenia offered human rights education to more than 200,000 children around the world. Our program is designed to foster tolerance and understanding of diversity in, in societies. Now, protecting schools against attacks and military use is essential to ensure children's access and rights to education. We have endorsed the Paris Principles and Commitments, the Safe School Declaration and Vancouver Principles, our commitment to ensure that schools in the conflict area remain a safe haven for, for children. Uh, Madam Special Representative, uh, in conclusion, we express Slovenia's full and firm support to your work and to your mandate. Uh, Slovenia will remain a strong advocate for child protection and all violations against children must be at the center of our efforts uh, to build back better and more peaceful future as the future we are building belongs to, to the children. I thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Bajchan. I'm going to turn now to Hasim. I see him, his handsome face on the screen so he can speak. And next I'll go after that to Albania. Hi, thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to deliver these remarks on behalf of Her Excellency Ali Ahmed bin Saif Al Thani, a permanent representative of the State of Qatar to the United Nations. The State of Qatar is delighted to co sponsor this high level event with Norway and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict to mark the 25th anniversary of the mandate of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict. The State of Qatar views the Children and Armed Conflict mandate as one of the most important components of the human rights, peace and security, peace building, a development and humanitarian agendas. We have often called for further investment and prevention efforts to better protect and prevent violations against children. For instance, under the leadership of Your Highness Sheikh Moza bin Nasser, 
chairperson of education above all and UN sustainable development goals advocate and spearheaded by the state of Qatar, the General Assembly adopted resolution number 74 slash 275 establishing 9 September as the International Day to protect education from attack. The resolution aims to raise awareness to the light children affected by armed conflict who are in the most desperate need of educational supports. It also provides a key annual platform where the international community can review progress, new data, and make a commitment towards effective mechanisms to end impunity for those who attack schools. We are extremely proud to host and financially support the analysis and outreach, outreach hub of the Office of the Special a representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict in Doha, which aims at strengthening the knowledge and skills on protection of children affected by conflicts within the region. The hub also works to generating global support, resources, and new actions to better protect children affected by conflicts. An important objective is to promote the collection of information and documentation of best practices and advocacy on issues of concern. I'd like to conclude these brief remarks by reiterating the state of Qatar's sustained commitment to the mandate of the SRSG office and to fully support efforts to prevent and address widespread impact of armed conflict on children. I thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to turn now to um, um, Albana from Albania. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And finally, we managed to get connected. Uh, I would like to thank the Mission of Norway and the Office of the SRSG uh, on CAC and all those involved in organizing this high level meeting to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the children and armed conflict. I would like to thank also all the speakers and uh, we were also uh, we are happy also to co-sponsor this event. Uh, 25 years after the UN General Assembly created a mandate dedicated to strengthening the protection of children affected by armed conflict, we have strong reasons to be proud of. I'll not mention all the achievements as the panelists they already did and these achievements in our view should be further consolidated. But work is far from over, and despite progress made in strengthening the normative and institutional framework on CAC, the situation today remains grim for many children worldwide. And for this reason, Albania calls on all parties to take the necessary measures to stop violations on, of children in armed conflicts, to stop attacks on schools and hospitals by upholding the provisions of international, international humanitarian law and international international human rights law. For this to happen, we must focus more on prevention. Albania strongly supports the efforts of the Secretary General and joy, joins his call to turn the protection of children in armed conflict into a central part of the United Nations peace and security agenda and place it at the core of our prevention efforts. We do believe that CAC man mandate is an important tool in the international community's efforts to prevent these crimes from happening. We need to strengthen the CAC mandate and make it better to tackle the actions and violations made by non-state groups. Precisely for the, all these reasons, in the course of the last two years, the Albanian government has taken steps to address the outrageously dire situation of children and women of Albanian origin caught in several refugee camps in Syria and Iraq. In October 2020, four children were safely repatriated, following by a larger group of 14 children in August 2021. All have been successfully reintegrated to normal life. Further, we are proud to have provided shelter for around 2,000 Afghanis, 40% of which are children who are living a second life in Albania. Dear Chair, as a member of the Security Council, Albania will engage to strengthen and promote the CAC agenda in the Council, will work with all like-minded countries to ensure that children protection provisions and capacity are included in all relevant mandates of United Nations keep peacekeeping operations and special political missions. In concluding, Albania will continue to strongly support the mandate of the CAC 
and its role in ma mainstreaming the protection of children in the broader work of the UN system, convinced that children should never have to experience the horrific impact of conflict. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have uh, the next five speakers are the UK, Greece, Luxembourg, Malta, and Switzerland. Fergus, you're up. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for, for taking us through the session so well. We'd also like to thank um, the special representative, the Norwegian government, um, for organising this, this meeting to celebrate the launch of this uh, flagship 25-year report. Uh, and thanks to all the briefers for the excellent overview we've had. We're proud to co-sponsor this meeting. Um, the UK also wants to commend the special representative and her predecessors for all their important work to drive this agenda forward um, uh, this year and over the past 25 years. There can be no doubt that over the last 25 years, as we've heard, that thanks to the tireless efforts of all of those working to protect children in conflict settings, the mandate has proved to be successful in protecting the lives of countless children. But uh, as the Secretary, Secretary General has recently said, the children and armed conflict mandate is more important than ever. The UK recognises that protecting children from the effects of armed conflict is a moral, legal and strategic imperative and an essential element to break the cycle of violence. We're proud to contribute to UNICEF's monitoring and reporting mechanism to ensure it's robust for the challenges to come. The UK has also pledged $123 million to Education Cannot Wait, the Global Fund for Education in Emergencies. And we strongly support the Safe Schools Declaration within the context of our Girls' Education Campaign. We must ensure implementation uh, of these initiatives is gender responsive, as we've heard from others, focused on getting girls back into school and recognising that they're impacted in unique ways by conflict. We call on all member states to endorse and implement the Safe Schools Declaration. In November 2021, the UK government launched the call to action to ensure the rights and well-being of children born of sexual violence in conflict, calling on the international community to mobilise in support of these children. We're delighted that Special Representatives Gamba, Patton and Marla Majid have all endorsed this initiative, along with our, some of our global partners and friends. We continue to seek endorsements from other member states and we encourage others to sign up as soon as possible. However, despite all of this good work across the international community, uh, and as others have said, the excellent efforts of the UN over the last 25 years, it's clear that more still needs to be done to protect this generation of children and the generations to come. The number of grave violations committed against children remains alarmingly high. The UK stands ready to work with our partners to ensure the mandate remains strong enough to meet the challenges of the next 25 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, who did I say was next? Greece. Maria. Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, it is, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to warmly thank and commend the organizers um, for um, organizing this uh, uh, commemorative uh, high level event. Um, since its establishment in 1997, all children and armed conflict mandate holders, as well as the personnel staffing the office, have demonstrated the utmost devotion and engagement in effectively translating policy into meaningful action and in systematically responding to the serious violations committed against children in conflict situations. In this regard, I would like to congratulate uh, Miss Virginia Gamba uh, for her devotion and personal commitment to achieve substantial progress on delivering positive results for the lives of thousands of children. Additionally, I would like to welcome the launch of the 25th anniversary study on the children and armed conflict mandate as a valuable tool for taking stock of the progress achieved so far and for shaping future endeavors. 
uh, in this context, I wish to reiterate uh, my country's support and determination to contribute substantially to the implementation of the UN Security Council agenda on children and armed conflict. Greece has already ratified the optional protocol uh, to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the Involvement of Children in Armed Conflict, as well as ILO Convention uh, 182 on the Worst Forms of Child Labor. In 2021, Greece adopted its first national action plan on the rights of the child, which is implemented regularly uh, was uh, monitored and assessed under the coordination uh, of a competent national mechanism. Moreover, uh, in order to enhance and the, the coherence of its national policies, this has included the protection of conflict affected girls in its first national action plan on women, peace and security. As a final word, uh, I would just want to say that it is only by protecting children from war and violence that we can create peaceful, secure, and resilient societies. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, thank you. Uh, I'd like to call now on Luxembourg. Luxembourg. Olivier, vous êtes là. Oui, bonjour, Olivier, cher are you there? Yes, yes. Good afternoon, dear Bob. Thank you so much for giving me the floor, dear colleagues. Director General of UNICEF, Special Representative Gamba, dear Virginia, dear Henrietta. It is a great honor for Luxembourg to participate in this event organized by Norway and the Office of the SRSG to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the mandate of the Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations for Children in Armed Conflicts. The study that has just been presented highlights the results of the remarkable results, in fact, of the remarkable work of the Special Representatives that have been in place since then. Since it was set up, of course, the mandate has evolved. Over the past 20 years, the number of conflicts covered by the mandate has quadrupled the characteristics of conflicts and uh, stakeholders in the conflicts have changed today. Climate change and COVID-19 have contributed to the worsening situation of children affected by conflict. The mandate of the SRSG is therefore more important than ever. In order to better protect children, we need to make progress in mainstreaming the topic of children in armed conflict in our work. There's also, in our opinion, a need to continue to uh, strengthen data collection. Luxembourg will continue to support the mandate as well as civil society activities. By working together, we will manage to prevent and bring an end to the six grave violations that children in armed conflict are victims of. Like my colleagues, I would like to encourage all those member states who have not done so to ratify the optional protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflict. Luxembourg will continue to be resolutely uh, committed to improving the protection of children affected by conflict. We did so in 2013, 2014, when it was our honor to chair the Security Council Working Group on Children in Armed Conflict. We'll also do this as part of our first term in the Human Rights Council from 2022 to 2024, for which promoting children's rights will be a top priority. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Malta, Vanessa. Thank you. Excellencies, colleagues, I thank Norway, Canada, and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict for organizing this event. I take the opportunity to reaffirm Malta's strong commitment towards the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict. As we recall, Resolution 5177, which set forth the areas of its mandate, we should also remember that this resolution is not only a lofty ideal to remain in policy charters, but also what we should continue striving to implement. 
The SRSG mandate has, since its founding in 1997, been unequivocally, unequivocally clear in its need to strengthen the protection of children affected by various scenarios, ranging from armed conflict to sexual exploitation. Above all, I believe we should always reaffirm what the resolution itself proclaims, that the best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration in all actions concerning children. Today's global challenges are different than 25 years ago. Nevertheless, the importance and relevance of the CAC mandate have increased. The urgency of safeguarding children's well-being makes it imperative to grasp any chance available. This is also why studies analyzing the evolution of the mandate and the effectiveness of measures taken so far, such as today's launch of ITIM. Secondly, we need to realize that legislation alone is not enough to prevent violations of the rights of the child. Stronger political commitments need to be demonstrated. Monitoring and reporting are key in gathering evidence of grave violations against children in reporting to the Security Council and implementing the mandate. As co-chairs of the Group of Friends on the Reintegration of Child Soldiers, a member of the Group of Friends on Children and Armed Conflict, Malta will continue contributing to the work of the SRSG's office and build a sustainable framework to address the protection of children affected by armed conflict. Excellencies, in conclusion, we are gathered here on the occasion of an anniversary. This should fill us with hope. Hope that children's rights to be protect to protection, education, childcare, and shelter will continue to be improved across all countries. Reason to believe that state governments will uphold their commitment to their safeguarding and do everything possible in this regard, even in times of societal upheaval or war. And last but not least, practical mechanisms that allow for a framework to take concrete steps to alleviate children's suffering wherever this may be the case. Malta stands ready to continue its part in strengthening the CAC man mandate. Should we be elected to the Security Council for 2023-2024, CAC will be a priority for Malta during its tenure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Switzerland, uh, the watch list on children in armed conflict, the EU. Uh, colleagues, we have 20 minutes okay, left. A little done. need to be clear. So um, we're going to have to cut down our comments to even briefer than perhaps you might have anticipated. Pascal. Merci, Monsieur le Président, cher Bob, Madame la Directrice Générale de l'UNICEF, cher Henriette, Madame USRG, Madam Representative, Special Representative of the Secretary General, dear Virginia, I'd like to start by thanking Norway and the SRSG, Virginia Gamba, for organizing this commemorative event and all those who have spoken for their very helpful contributions. 25 years is a generation. It's a period during which children are born, grow up, become adults. The work of the Office of the Special Representative has left a clear imprint since its creation. I'd like to join my Belgium colleague in congratulating Virginia Gamba and her team for their efforts, but it's clear there's still much to be done. While international humanitarian law for children benefits from special protection, still it needs to be fully respected and implemented at the national level. The United Nations, including Security Council, needs to therefore honor this anniversary with further commitment. If I may, I'd like to underscore two items first. We have significant tools to prevent violence against children. Let's use them fully. Let's reiterate our appeal to the Secretary General to continue to provide impartial, complete lists that are specific for the parties that are responsible for violations against children based on the monitoring and communications mechanisms in place. As a co-chair of the Group of Friends of Children with Yemen and Syria, Switzerland is engaged in more efforts of raising awareness and underscores and supports the work in Syria working with UNICEF. Secondly, the COVID pandemic and measures taken to stop the propagation of the virus has exacerbated vulnerability of children to, children, to violence and psychosocial distress, especially girls. We need to make sure that all measures 
to fight this are legal, necessary, and proportional. We thank all the protective staff that protect children, thousands of children in armed conflict around the world, despite the exceptional circumstances. Switzerland reiterates its support for the efforts of the United Nations and congratulations, especially with regard to monitoring communications and through the Council's working group. We remain engaged and committed for protecting children. By protecting them, we give them the ability to contribute to a more peaceful world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Uh, now I have Adrien, uh, Adrien Lafar from the watch list. Yes, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you. Uh, and colleagues, thank you very much for organizing this excellent event and for the opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of Watchlist on Children in Armed Conflict and its Civil Society Network. Since its establishment, 25 conflict mandate has made great protecting children from the impacts of war, as we've heard from the excellent presentations this afternoon. Yet even as we celebrate this progress, more children are living in conflict zones today than, than at any other time in the previous two decades. The rapid expansion of the global counterterrorism agenda threatens to undermine existing laws and norms for protecting children's rights. The COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated children's vulnerability to rights violations and abuse. Parties to conflict exploit the vulnerabilities of children, targeting them in distinct ways on the basis of gender, age, and disability. Today, as we celebrate this important progress made, we should also reflect on gaps and emerging challenges. We must redouble our efforts to create a brighter future for all children, especially those affected by war. We urge stakeholders to continue to build upon this progress, highlighting three key areas. First, we must defend and uphold existing protection frameworks. Governments that have not yet signed or ratified OPAC should do Similarly, those who have not yet endorsed the Paris Principles, Vancouver Principles, or Safe Schools Declaration should do so and take steps to incorporate the corresponding guidelines into their national military doctrines, trainings, and policy. Must ensure that efforts to counter terrorism and address national security concerns are consistent with their obligations to children. Children, including those allegedly associated with designated terrorist groups, should be treated primarily as victims. Second, we must strengthen efforts to prevent conflict before it starts and before it turns into a protracted crisis. Data on grave violations, including in countries not on the CAC agenda, should inform early warning and prevention efforts. Wherever there is credible information that parties are committing grave violations against children, the Secretary General should alert the Security Council by including such situations of concern in his annual CAC report. Better monitoring and reporting on grave violations and related abuses, including disaggregating data by gender, age, and disability, protect all children. Third, we must promote accountability for and to children. Governments should bring all perpetrators to justice, including through prompt investigation and prosecution for grave violations, the inclusion of child-specific expertise in investigative mechanisms, and support for national and including the ICC. The listing and delisting of perpetrators in the Secretary General's annual CAC reports remains one of the most unique powerful tools for promoting accountability. Member states should continue to call on the Secretary General to publish a credible evidence-based list in his annual report. Promoting accountability also means ensuring that programs and policies are accountable to the children they are designed to protect. Governments, the UN, and civil society should promote children's participation in decision-making processes affecting them, including peace processes ability and response to their inputs in line with children's best interests. In closing, we congratulate SRSG Gamba and her predecessors, Alara Atunu, Radhika Kumaraswamy, and Leila Zarugi, the dedicated staff in the office, and other essential stakeholders without whom this progress would not be possible. As civil society, we stand united with the SRSG, the member states, and the UN in the conviction that no child should suffer the continue to support the mandate and work towards that end. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, we, I, I have to be blunt, we, we're not gonna get everybody on the list. Um, so we're gonna go until um, the next three speakers. Uh, and then I think we're gonna have to bring it to a conclusion, um, unless the three speakers are brilliantly short. Uh, EU, Costa Rica and Germany. Thanks so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, Bob, it's been a, a really interesting uh, event. I want to thank you. I want to thank Norway, the foreign minister, and Mona and the team that leads the working group. And I want to thank, thank uh, Virginia and her team and all the excellent briefers this afternoon. This is such an important event that the EU has uh, produced a formal statement. It's in writing. I will not repeat it here in, in the interest of time. Three very brief points, Bob based on my own experience chairing the working group in 2017, 2018. Much progress has been made. You've all pointed to it, but much else, much more needs to be done. One starting point that I believe remain a valid and unfulfilled is um, how uh, the, the victimizing children in conflict not only affects the child itself, but the, in, the entire society where this occurs. So with the same logic that we use when we discuss women, peace and security, very rightly saying that there has to be a meaningful participation of, in that case, women. I think the same logic applies for having the interests and representatives of children around the table whenever relevant. Uh, uh, and that is, it has to be much more systematic in the Security Council than it is today. Second point, Norway is doing a great job leading this working group but it can't be just left to Norway. It has to be an agenda which is owned and dedicated by all members of the Security Council, all 15. So this has to be a prisma for, uh, for all and a consistent uh, way of a lens uh, under which decisions of the Security Council are adopted. Third point, Bob, very briefly, and that follows to what I just said. Um, we urge members of the Security Council to mainstream the CAC agenda across the work of the Council, invite the SRSG and representatives of children uh, to uh, uh, brief the, the, the Security Council on country, country situations where relevant, consistently raising these issues, including on child protection, protection during Security Council visits in the field, and to ensure that child protection is addressed in relevant mandate discussions of all UN missions and as a criterion for sanctions regimes uh, when that is relevant. And finally, as many have said, we need to uh, protect the independence, impartiality and credibility of the monitoring and reporting mechanism and the lists that so many have mentioned. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thanks, Olaf. Thank you very much. Costa Rica. Costa Rica here. Germany, go. Bob, well, thank you so much. It's a great initiative. Thanks also to Norway and thanks to the special representative Gamba for bringing us together today. This is an important meeting. Um, 25 years of CAC are a reason to celebrate, but it's not a reason only to pat ourselves on the shoulders. There are challenges and we must live up to them. Let me mention three. First of all, we have to make sure that we implement the existing framework for the protection of children in armed conflict. This means very specifically, we need to endorse the Safe Schools Declaration. Everybody should do so. We need to endorse the Paris Principles and the Vancouver Principles. And this is a very important point. It's important that we see more ratifications of the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the involvement of children in armed conflict. My second point, accountability continues to be essential. This means in particular that the listing and the delisting of perpetrators in the Secretary General's annual CAC reports remains one of the most powerful tools in this regard. It's therefore absolutely imperative that what is found and what is written down in the report of the Secretary General is consistently reflected in the listings contained in the annexes. My third and last point, 
we must put an end to circles of violence from which children are the first to suffer. This means also that conflict affected children should not be treated as perpetrators, but primarily as victims, and that they receive the support that they dearly need. We celebrate 25 years of CAC. That's a great opportunity. Let's use the impetus in order to make sure that we advance on the three challenges and on others that colleagues have mentioned. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you. I see Maritza Chan is there. So Maritza, you can be the last speaker from Costa Rica. Thank you so much, <laughs> Ambassador. Despite the achievements made 25 years after the adoption of Resolution 5177, six grave violations against children in armed conflict are still being committed, often with impunity, and increasingly by state actors. On this note, please allow me to stress four points. First, while 85% of children have been recruited to join militias, 98% of sexual violence was perpetrated against girls. The use of sexual violence as a weapon of war is unacceptable. We must end the impunity of perpetrators by strengthening laws and enforcing them. Second, despite international legal protections, schools are being targeted by bombing raids or used for military purposes. Costa Rica calls member states to join in support of a strong political declaration on strengthening the protection of civilians from humanitarian harm arising from the use of explosive weapons in densely populated areas. Third, there is an opportunity cost involved in excessive military spending, which has continued to increase during the pandemic. Countries with high military spending are less likely to enact pandemic-related measures to support the particular needs of women and girls during this crisis. Costa Rica believes that disarmament and a sustained reduction of military spending will result in resources that could be invested towards human security, critical infrastructure, and institutional building. Fourth, Costa Rica welcomes the study on the evolution of children on armed conflict mandate 1996-2021 the study suggests a renewed way forward to reinvigorate protection of children in armed conflict by, based on prevention, collaboration, reintegration, and a strengthened monitoring mechanism. In closing, a world fit for children is a world where children and armed conflict do not mix. I thank you. Well, thank you, colleagues. I'm afraid I had to be fairly blunt about just cutting the list off. I know those, there will be those who will be disappointed. Um, but uh, really appreciate the, um, the depth and the range of the comments and the discussion. Uh, I hope, Virginia, you feel uh, renewed and inspired by the amount of support that you've heard from, uh, from around the world uh, in terms of the work that you're doing, but also the work that has to be done. Um, I, I heard a couple of things very clearly. One is the, the word mainstreaming was used a lot it's not just at the Security Council, it's everywhere. It's in the Peace Building Commission. It's in the work that we do on peacekeeping. Uh, it's broadening the awareness uh, in every part of the system about the importance of protecting children, the priority that we must give to children in everything we do. Um, and only think about the number of kids who have been kept out of school for the last year and a half because of COVID-19. Uh, think think more broadly of the of the real challenge that we're we're leaving this generation of children because of climate change, and because of the fact that we know there are circumstances that will get more and more difficult. So that's something I think when we talk about mainstream, I think we really have to figure out how to how to make that an even bigger thing. The the, the second is is this is is the importance of education. And perhaps I can be permitted to say to Henrietta, uh, we are going to miss you uh, at, uh, at UNICEF. You have been such a beacon uh, and fighter for giving education the priority it deserves. But we really have to work hard at making sure that uh, we, we really allow children to be children, give them the joy of learning, give them the challenge of, of, uh, of growing up in a world that's safer for them where they can feel safe. I think the comments that have been made about accountability, about sexual violence, and particularly about the vulnerability of young women, 
I think these are all exceptionally important things that we need to continue to build into the work that we all do. Et je veux remercier tout le monde, de surtout féliciter Virginia pour son travail, uh, toute l'équipe qui ont participé dans cette discussion. Participated in this discussion, everybody for their work. It was a rich and deep discussion. I'd like to thank our interpreters and those who organized the conference, which was successful, took place in a very professional manner, and we very much appreciate that. And we hope that you appreciate that it's five o'clock and it's over. We are respecting you.